The Day of the Crows, a modern story retold by Kevin Bashford. Five minutes later, after he had swept the ceiling, he was certain that all the light fixtures in the flat were alive with this radiation. Terry focused on the symptoms that he had denied to himself for so long the shakes, the constantly fluctuating feet muscles, the burnt back, a head so muffled that even the most valiant attempts could not focus through to spark the neural networks effectively. And now the flat was just as messed up as Terry's brain. What could be going on? And what could be acting on the pipes to cause this? Terry placed the meter on the radiators. They were all, unsurprisingly, emitting radiation. Terry investigated electromagnetism and he found that videos on pulsed radiation were freely available. One of the videos showed how radar affected aphids. The poor creatures flinched every three seconds as the radar swept through their skeletons. Was this what was happening to Terry? It was urgent to get answers. The scientific papers that Terry read on the matter indicated that biological systems registered some effects at any sustained level above 0.01 a micro t and this made him shiver with concern. The finding was certainly backed up by peer review across the scientific community, but seemingly had not been investigated by the authorities. Terry sat despondently upon the studio windowsill. He took some more readings from left to right, and right to left. 0.17 a micro t, then 0.26 a micro t, 0.35 a micro t, then into the red 0.45 a micro t before dropping back to 0.06 a micro t. Every time that the power of the signal rose and fell, Terry could correlate a metallic ting on the back of his head. This might be a common thing to deal with, he thought. Terry searched the flat for useful objects that could block the signals and the Victorian brass objects which Terry had received from his late aunt May immediately took on an extra importance. Their metal content was old, matured and heavy, and as soon as the brass crocodile was set up as an absorber on the studio windowsill, the surrounding readings fell. He carefully twisted some wire around its tail and fixed the wire with clear tape to the window. This seemed to do the job. Terry knew that the brass objects had been used to amplify the radio signals from across the English Channel in the 1920A census. The beautifully crafted crocodile now had an extra purpose and these voices from the past encouraged and reassured Terry as he envisioned that by the setting up of these small devices as barriers he would bring some sort of clarity to his life. The signals, as he measured them, appeared to flow through the studio window space on a horizontal plane. Terry focused upon this, ignoring for now the fact that they also appeared to be entering the rest of the flat from other undefined directions. He placed the metal objects into strategic positions. Two minutes later and the EMF readings at the studio window had been reduced to about 0.16 a micro t, and, despite what appeared to be further attempts, they gradually fell off to a 0.06 a micro t maximum. He heard the pigeon settling under the guttering in the corner of the kitchen, cooing their excitement. They had frequently nested in this roofing gap, sheltered from the elements, but for the last five years this lodging had mostly become an area to avoid. They had tried to stay, but were constantly being spooked off to other areas. In the evening, Terry lay back on the lounge sofa. From that position he could locate streams of radiation that flew through the curtains, over his body and down to the floor. He allowed the meter to sit in the curtain folds and watched as it ran up and down the scale. By fixing wires with tape to the lounge window he managed to inconvenience the flow, but it was far too strong to stop completely. Terry leaned out of the far lounge window and looked to his right at a pigeon that was sat under the corner eaves. The bird looked over at him with interest and returned a nod, its knowledgeable red eye winking. Terry knew that something was wrong and he closed the window. It is a fact that the recommended voltage in any living space should be low, if apparent at all. Continual readings exceeding 5 V. M were known to induce harmful effects. Terry was measuring up to 200 V, M in the walls, ceilings and floor. High voltage readings were taken in every room. 50 V, M under the bed, 100 V, 
M in the hallway. Terry now took to heart the task of ridding his flat of these harmful intrusions and he confirmed his allegiance with a strong coffee and an even stronger stare at the city skyline. Terry set to work trying to block the areas of greatest concern. The upper door frames of the flat were decked with various copper coins lined in the hope that they would absorb the energy of the rays. It looked like the interior of an old country wagon. He spent an hour decorating the flat, full of resolve, now that the obscenity of his problem was clear. It was possible that some of Terry's additions might be seen from the outside, so he took great care to use the sight line looking up from the back channel road as a guiding line. He carefully attached wires to the windows and, as Aunt May's Sphinx and Armatured Fish both proved good absorbers of radiation, Terry put them in position around the flat. The high values on his meter were clearly being dulled as he began to reduce the intrusive voltage that was lining his flat. Over the next few days, Terry would learn the mysterious nature of the other metal objects in his flat. He saw how certain metals reflected, absorbed magnified or scrambled signals. A device was constructed from two metal CD racks and a bunch of old wires that Terry had found in the cupboard. This he named the baffler and it took its position on the studio windowsill where the cross signal could be intercepted. The spare amplifier was placed near Terry's feet to shield his feet from the shocks rising from the floor and the old speakers were stacked up against the far studio wall. If metal worked then he would need to order metallic tapes. He could now now clearly see that the reason for his unwittingly lifting his feet from the studio floor so often was the massive voltage prevalent there. Terry's legs had developed ulcers and blood clots that were constantly moving at night, annoyingly twitching under the skin. His muscles tried to find their normal tone but were a constant irritation. The body's healing attempts were a ridiculous failure. His upper legs were now spotted with small pinpricks of blood and when he inspected his shoulders he found skin cells that were blasted out, as if by a strong summer sun. Maybe all these now had a dreadfully clear cause. Each injury appeared to follow the nerve lines in his body as if the damage was focused upon his more sensitive systems. He would find a strange ringed pattern of small pinprick blisters on his skin, or his ankle bones developed brown indentations. Terry's shoulders often felt as if a host of needles had been punched into them. For years, he had discussed his psychic well-being with friends. It seemed to him a complete mystery how his sharp and wide-ranging thoughts had been altered. He recalled that all that he needed to do was concentrate in order to compose the shortest of musical numbers. Now he needed to concentrate like never before and Terry found it near impossible to shape and alter the music in his mind. He had always worked a certain way rewriting the song many times before finally playing it through. He would faultlessly switch on his critical mind and this had never been a problem until recently. Now he had had to relearn the process in the depths of despair. An all-surrounding depressive atmosphere was stripping original thoughts from his mind and casting them to the rocks like sailors to an echoey cave of harpies. To alleviate the symptoms, Terry walked and, over the years, he had mostly used the flat as a bolt hole as he performed most evenings. Perhaps this had been the deciding factor in maintaining his health. When his back muscles ached in the evening Terry rolled them into action as if in preparation to play a full concerto and now he could see how singing was a therapy to maintain his lung capacity. The tapes began to arrive during the next week and they were stuck to the areas of strongest concern, mostly under the window sills in the studio the bedroom and the kitchen. At the fuse box, a collage-like grid of tape was added but this had little success stemming the pollution. Each attempt to stop the onslaught gave some respite, but the signals returned like leaking water. The vertical wire casing under the fuse box soon became a totem pole of copper and aluminium. Out of desperation, Old food tins were stacked up on the lower wooden box which contained the old fuse box and mains cable. The kitchen cupboards and electric keyboards all received a length of copper tape and he observed with interest the effect of these additions. A speculative line of aluminium broken by a strip of copper linked the glass of the bedroom window to its frame and this seemed to work well. Terry had a good night's sleep. Outside of the bedroom, however, 
Terry was still feeling like a strip of metal in a bell jar. His hearing was constantly being affected and on some days the electromagnetic sea that swelled through the walls was so strong that he was flung back to hardly hearing a thing. By 10.00 a.m. on one Monday morning, he already knew that this would be a days that fortune would guide. That weekend he had spent too long delving into the flat's toxic areas and now his mind was shot. Terry packed the laptop, left the flat and he could be found listening to music on the green.